Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia and other calcium sensing disorders. Familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, as the name suggests, is a cause of hypercalcemia. It runs in the family and is characterized by autosomal dominant inheritance with high penetrance. Affected people typically present in childhood where they get hypocalciuria peeing uh, low amounts of calcium, despite having elevated calcium levels in the blood, hypercalcemia. The problems with, um, the reason for these changes is due to problems with calcium sensing in the body. Familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is one type of calcium sensing disorder. Another type, a complete opposite, is autosomal dominant hypocalcemia which we will touch on later on. Let's talk about the normal physiology first. So parathyroid gland contains parathyroid cells, which are called chief cells. Uh, the chief cells contain parathyroid hormones, which are ready to be released. These cells respond to calcium levels in the blood via calcium sensing receptors, abbreviated CASR. This is a G protein coupled receptor. When CASR notices that there are low levels of calcium, the chief cells will begin releasing parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone ha main goal is to increase blood calcium levels. And it does this by targeting three main organs. In the bones, parathyroid hormone promotes bone resorption through the action of osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are the bone-eating cells, uh, which will release calcium and phosphate in the blood. Parathyroid hormone also targets the kidneys. It increases calcium reabsorption, but decreases phosphate reabsorption. Parathyroid hormone also targets an enzyme in the kidneys called 1-alpha-hydroxylase. This enzyme promotes the conversion of calcidiol to calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D. Active vitamin D is known as 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol, um, abbreviated here. And its role is that it targets the gut, increasing calcium and phosphate absorption. So in summary, parathyroid hormone will increase uh, serum calcium levels. The rise in serum calcium levels will be detected by the calcium sensing receptor, the CASR, and the CASR will put a break on the parathyroid cells to stop releasing parathyroid hormone. It's a fine balance. The chief cells uses the calcium sensing receptors to sense blood calcium levels and respond appropriately. On a side note, the production of active vitamin D it has a negative feedback as well on the parathyroid gland, telling it to ease up the production of parathyroid hormone because it's no longer required. Familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is caused by inactivating mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. And so basically in the presence of high calcium levels, the calcium sensing receptors don't detect this properly and will still release small eloquots of parathyroid hormone, further increasing blood calcium levels. People with familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia typically only have mild hypercalcemia. Patients with familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia still have a functional calcium sensing receptor. It's just the set point of which it responds to high calcium levels is now higher. So as an example depicted by this graph, you have on the x-axis serum calcium levels, and on the y-axis, the calcium sensing receptor uh, regulation of parathyroid hormone release. Normal serum calcium levels is between 2.2 and 2.6 millimoles per liter. 
And this is well maintained by the calcium sensing receptor regulating the parathyroid hormone release, right? Well, in familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia, the graph shifts to the right, meaning there is decreased sensitivity to serum calcium levels. This means that calcium sensing receptors uh, regulation of parathyroid hormone release will only respond to higher calcium levels. And hence, you typically only get a mild hypercalcemia because the calcium sensing receptor is still working. It just requires a lot more prompting to work. Familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia also causes physiological changes in the kidneys. So as we have learned, the kidneys um, respond to parathyroid hormone by uh, absorbing calcium, but also causes phosphate excretion. It does so by targeting cells in the proximal convoluted tubule, inhibiting the sodium and phosphate symptoma, causing hyperphosphoruria and therefore reduces blood phosphate levels. Throughout the nephron, the kidneys also contain these calcium sensing receptors. The most important effect of calcium sensing receptors here is probably found in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Here in purple, the calcium sensing receptors are found on the basal surface of the cells, and so on the bottom, close to the bloodstream. We're now talking about normal physiology. The thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle contains a co-transporter on the apical surface, uh, basically where the lumen is, where P is. The co-transporter carries one sodium, two chloride, and one potassium. This is the transporter which the class of diuretics called loop diuretics inhibit. Anyway, Although the process of transporting these electrolytes is electrically neutral, most of the potassium reabsorbed by the co-transporter leaks back into the lumen to drive further inward sodium chloride transport. This movement of cationic potassium into the lumen plus the reabsorbed chloride out of the basolateral surface of the cell will generate a net trans epithelial potential difference. What does this mean? Well, the interstitial fluid and capillaries will be negative in respect to the tubular lumen. The resulting lumen electropositivity will drive the passive reabsorption of cations, sodium, but also the calcium and magnesium via paracellular pathways between the cells. I hope that made sense. On a side note, you have these proteins called chlorodins, which help in paracellular transport of calcium and magnesium ions from the lumen into the blood. So as we have learned, when someone has hypercalcemia, normally this tells the parathyroid gland to stop producing parathyroid hormone, right? But also hypercalcemia is detected by the calcium sensing receptors in the kidneys which results in a number of things. One, it will inhibit sodium potassium ATPase here. It will inhibit the potassium efflux pump on the apical surface, and it will inhibit clodins. Um, and so in summary, in hypercalcemia, calcium sensing receptors here will respond by reducing the reabsorption of calcium and magnesium. And this will result in elevated calcium levels in urine, hypercalciuria which will help the body transition back to normocalcemia, normal levels of calcium in the blood. In familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, there is inactivating mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. The receptors don't work and you end up reabsorbing the calcium and magnesium, leading to hypocalciuria and mild hypercalcemia and hypermagnesemia. It is an important concept to remember that familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, as the name suggests, causes hypocalciuria. 
investigations and other supportive uh, investigations for diagnosis is um, a urinary calcium and creatinine ratio less than 0.01, a reduced 24-hour urinary calcium, and genetic testing, especially if family history is difficult to obtain. An important differential diagnosis is asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism, which also causes, you know, hypercalcemia. But it's important to know the difference because the cause and treatment of the two are different. In primary hyperparathyroidism, the, the main cause is typically a benign adenoma. It is a very common cause of hypercalcemia. Uh, compared to familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia, which is a rare cause of hypercalcemia. A good differentiating factor is that familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia, there is a family history, and it typically only causes a mild hypercalcemia. In primary hyperparathyroidism, people can range from asymptomatic to full-blown symptomatic hypercalcemia, which I will not discuss what these symptoms are. The treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism is a pyrothyroidectomy, whereas in familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia, it is observation and possibly calcimimetics. Finally, in primary hyperparathyroidism, the calcium sensing receptors still work, they function normally, and therefore, in the presence of hypercalcemia, the kidneys will inhibit the reabsorption of calcium and magnesium, resulting in hyper calciuria rather than hypocalciuria in familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Going back to calcimimetics, sorry, the calcimimetics is a drug that mimics calcium. The body perceives that they have much more uh, calcium than they actually do, which will essentially be detected by the calcium sensing receptors and, and thus um, they will respond appropriately. So that concludes the talk on familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia. But another calcium sensing disorder I want to talk about is autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, which is an activating gain of function mutation of the calcium sensing receptors. Essentially, the calcium sensing receptors are active and tightly regulates parathyroid hormone release it essentially puts a break on the release of parathyroid hormone. In the kidneys, the same thing, the calcium sensing receptor is activated, and so you are inhibiting calcium and magnesium reabsorption. And so as a result, you get, you know, hypocalcemia. Now, remember, the serum calcium graph I spoke about earlier, well, now you require a much lower calcium level to cause parathyroid hormone release and the reabsorption of calcium and magnesium in the kidney. Patients with autosomal dominant hypocalcemia typically have mild hypocalcemia. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.